welcome to this week's edition of On Point. I'm Leighton Levy, your host. My guest this week created history at the Tokyo Olympics this past summer when she finished third in the 100-meter hurdles for women, the first Jamaican and the first woman from the Caribbean to win a medal in the event, in the event at the Olympic Games. I'm talking about Megan Tapper. Megan Tapper, thanks for joining us on On Point this week. It's a pleasure having you on. Thank you so much for having me, Layton. Thank you, thank you, thank you. All right, great. So let me first of all uh, start with the preseason. How has that been going? It's been going well. I started off officially with my coach in Austria, and we just kind of realized where we fell short in 2021 and decided to start off this year on uh, uh, not better foot because we did do well last year, but uh, a stronger foot. Yeah. Well, of course, 12.53 is a whole tenth of a second down from your personal best from the, from the previous season. Um, so, you know, it's a big step forward. But let me ask you this, because I want to start here. Creating history in Tokyo is one thing, but the, the, the reaction to it has been significant. How has your life changed since that bronze medal? Because, you know, you're like the talk of the town across <laughs> the Caribbean. <laughs> well, the, the, the thing that stands out the most to me is people's reaction to me. A lot of the times, unless I'm working with Matthew, they think it's me, but then they have to look twice. And so most of the time they're like this, <laughs> and then when I smile, you're like, you can't hide, you know, you can't hide. But no style, you make on top of you can't hide. <laughs> so that's the biggest thing. And then when I'm with my kids, they just know instantly. They just say, make on top of, yeah, hi, big up, love you, everything. And it's just the love that I've received from my Jamaican people and Austrians has just been remarkable. And that's the biggest change that I've noticed. What, what's the reaction in Austria? Uh, well, after the Olympics, I went out a couple of times to get some food with my coach. And most, if not all of those times, my meal was paid for by an Austrian. Wow. <laughs> yeah. There are, yeah. Big, there are yeah. big benefits to being an Olympic medalist, it seems. <laughs> <laughs> Apparently so, apparently so. Okay, but be beyond that though, Meg, um, you know, now comes the, the anonymity goes away. Huh? Prior to this, you were the hardworking lion who we saw in, in Doha in 2019. You know, the, the, the athlete that could, but just couldn't get over that last hurdle, so to speak. You've done that now. Um, does the, anon uh, the lack of anonymity become a challenge now in how you go forward? Because your privacy kind of is impacted now because you're famous now. <laughs> uh, well, no, I feel like I have been preparing for this moment all my life. And so now that it's finally here, I just want to bask in it and I just want to appreciate it as much as possible. I don't mind people showing me love on the road because love is just one of those emotions that you just always want to feel and so being appreciated by my countrymen by my jamaican people is just something that i'll never ever get tired of so i don't mind my anonymity being lessened um if anything it it, it pushes me to be better and to want to be better all right so let, let's go back a decade huh? i remember the first time we met was <laughs> in just after you came back from the World Youth Championships in Lille, France. Yes. At that time, was this what you envisioned your career would become? Olympic Absolutely. medalist? Absolutely. I've always had magnanimous dreams. <laughs> <laughs> always, always, always. And so this was always the path that I wanted to be on and that I've worked to be on. Yeah, well, yeah, and it's, it's, it's not been a smooth ride because, you know, I've, used, I've heard the criticisms of you, and of course, I'm sure you would have heard them along the way. You're too short, you're too small, you know, you're not quick enough. But in your own mind, did those sentiments create any doubt about what you'd be able to accomplish once you got the right circumstances? Ah, uh, no. No, I've always been one to... Yeah. Have you ever heard the story about the donkey and the farmer, I think? 
the farmer didn't see uh, the donkey as profitable anymore, of use anymore, and so he threw him in a hole and started to cover him with sand or dirt. And every time he threw the dirt on the donkey, the donkey would shake it off and trod on it, and then threw more and shake it off and trod on it. And that same dirt that he thought would be the end of the donkey ended up being his uh, triumph for the thing that saved him. Well, that's what I see the negativity as. First of all, I don't hear it much. Mm. I don't hear it much because I make it my duty to curate my space and surround myself with people who are for Megan and not against. But when I do hear it, I use it as motivation. It stings, it hurts, but I love it because I know that when I hear something like that, something in Megan clicks and yeah. <laughs> Okay, you're talking about click. I mean, you're giving me the segues here perfectly. So, <laughs> so, so, 2019, you make it to the finals of the World Championships in Doha. Yes. Many people saw the improvement. They saw you running well. You saw you running consistently. You're in the final and you hit the first hurdle and fall to the track. I remember watching distinctly and watching you punch the track in frustration. Tell me a little bit about what went through your mind there and where, where did the motivation click? after that moment? Well, uh, just thinking about that moment, thinking about Megan in that moment, just complete and utter devastation, mashup. I was just, it was, it was unbelievable. I couldn't believe that that opportunity that I trained for so long and so hard and that I was so ready for ended in such devastation. I mean, there's no other word that can basically describe that moment. As I said, I was, I've never been ready up to that moment for a race the way I was ready for that final. And unfortunately, I wasn't able to finish the race. And the feelings are overwhelming. I wasn't able to be the composed Megan that most of us know, that most of you know. <laughs> Because the emotions, they were just so raw and overwhelming. Uh, but where did it, where did the motivation click afterwards? I mean, back to curating your space, back to surrounding yourself with people who know what the goal is and know that you are capable of achieving that goal. Um, so I'll reach out to the various people who were in my circle at the time and they would say to me, don't worry about it. This is just another roadblock. You are still Megan. You are still capable. You, If anything is still possible for you, shake it off and let's go again. And so that's basically how, or talking to my support team was how the motivation came back for me. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, because, you know, that fall wasn't your first, your, your first stumble, literally. Um, you know, and to keep picking yourself back up requires a certain mental fortitude that I don't think a lot of people are associated with you. Is that, has that been an underlying characteristic for you f from ever since, or was it something that you developed later on as you started competing, regardless whether in high school or at the, at the, at the senior level? Oh, no. Uh, determination and... Grit is something that I, what that was ingrained in me from my days in gymnastics. So as most of you should know by now, <laughs> yeah. I was a gymnast. Yes. So I went to the Ishimoto School of Gymnastics where a Japanese was my coach. And if I learned anything, it was to push through when the road is extremely rocky, when you can't see the end, when you have no energy left. It is to just continue pushing and, and never ever giving up. And I always say that gymnastics is one of the best foundations that you can give your child because I feel like a lot of things that I've learned in order to conquer my different or, or to hurdle my different things in life was learned from gymnastics and learned from Mr. Ishimoto himself. Mm -hmm. And you mentioned gymnastics. I mean, a, a number of world-class athletes, uh -huh. Yelena Izenbieva, world-class long pole vaulter, um, has, you know, she, was, she did gymnastics in preparing for what became a very outstanding career as a pole vaulter. Has it helped you physically on the track, that flexibility, that, that strength, upper body strength, 
you know, does that help you hurdling at all? Absolutely. Absolutely. The reason why I chose hurdling is because I knew that with my gymnastics background and my dancing background, I'd have been able to get that uh, technique easily. And so gymnastics is definitely a huge part of why Megan, who is, why Megan is who she is today, right. basically. Fair enough. Okay, so let's, let's talk about Coach Onfred because he is the man who took you to those, you know, dizzying heights. Tell me a little bit about how you, 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 I mean, he's in Austria, you're in Jamaica. How did that link happen in the first place? Uh, when he came to training camp with his, one of his athletes, uh, Ivona Dadic, he's an Austrian heptathlete, and I saw him, I never really paid him any mind, because <laughs> I mean, you know, he's just training and he's having fun, but we kept in touch on Instagram, and uh, yeah. <laughs> So, so you, you did it through social media. Yes. So eventually, when you decided to change your coaching situation, you know what was it about him that made you think that he was the the go to guy? Uh, well, Philip was just always available in a situation where he wasn't necessarily receiving anything from being available. And in this world, you know, a lot of people give only when they see that they're going to get something out of it. And the fact that he was so uh, willing and so kind when there was no benefit to him, it kind of resonated in me or to me. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. What was that discussion like? I mean, when you, when you approached him, you know, what was, what was the conversation like? Can you coach me? And, you know, and he said, yes, I'm, I'm sure that must have been an ongoing situation because of the distance, first of all. And of course, I know eventually your husband, Matthew, became the conduit. Um, yes. But, you know, how did that initial conversation happen? Uh, well, as I said, he just always made himself available. Mm -hmm. So when the time came and I was looking for somebody, um, he was there. <laughs> he just so. said it was as simple as that. He said yes. Yeah. Well, yeah. Yeah. Some people have it easy in life. <laughs> <laughs> well, in some things, in some things. something. <laughs> so of course, so the program started, and um, you're here in Jamaica. You know, Matthew was overseeing your program. He was, of course, delivering the program. Coach Onfred, that is. What were those initial days like in terms of? You know, the communication, the, the program itself, you know, was there a challenge making the transition from, from one program to the next? And, and how did Matthew facilitate that? It was fantastic. It was amazing. I loved absolutely every second of it. And yeah, it was just amazing. <laughs> there were no hiccups. There were no moments of doubt that you thought, you know, was this the right move? You know, was there any any of that? Because change is always change is always constant, but mm -hmm. it often comes with periods of doubt, periods of uncertainty when you're stepping out into new ground. Mm -hmm. Did you have any of those moments in the initial phases of the program? Uh, all right. The thing with me is that if I'm going to trust you to do my program. I'm going to trust you to do my program. I'm not going to uh, be in and out, basically, because I know that track and field is 100% mental. If you're not mentally there, and if you don't trust the program that you're doing mentally, then will it work? You know. And so that was something very important. I knew that I had to always just not follow or go down the rabbit hole with doubt. Mm -hmm. And the second thing is, Philip would always answer my questions. He'd always be listening. He'd always ask me questions and ensure that I'm good with whatever is happening. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I'm not, a, I'm not a young athlete anymore. So I have a little bit of experience under my belt. And so he'd ensure that he included all of that into the program and not just make it seem like he was the only one with you know, the expertise, mm -hmm. etc. Yeah, so tell me, you know, you know, obviously co coaching is, is basically man management in many ways. Um, give me an idea of what it is like to be coached by him, given, you know, you, we all know the challenges that you faced here in Jamaica. But the thing is, inspirationally, in terms of getting you constantly focused on the job at hand, 
you know, what were some of the things that you think he did that made the difference for you? First of all, it's fun. Training with Matthew and Philip is a breath of fresh air for me. I love it. Um, secondly, to have people who believe in you when you don't believe in yourself is something that can uplift you when you yourself don't believe in what you're doing or who you are or what you can achieve. And the fact that he, Philip, understood that at first I'm human and then second, I'm an athlete. The fact that he understood that and not only understood it, but made it be a guiding light for our relationship, I think is what played a major role in the success of Twins 21. Mm -hmm. And of course, there are periods during the last season, of course, like you have so far this preseason, you've had to fly to Austria. Was the adjustment in Austria challenging for you? It's a new environment, it's a different country, different culture. And of course, you would have um, people training along with you within that camp in, in Austria. What was that experience like? First of all, bonding with your new training partners, so to speak. I mean, I know you're lovable and everything, but the thing is, you know, getting into a new environment can be challenging in many respects. What was that like for you? It was it was great actually. My training partner Ivona is just as crazy as I am, so we <laughs> mesh. <laughs> we mesh really well. Philip made every effort to ensure that I was comfortable. He, not a day passed where he never asked me if I was okay, if I needed anything. Uh, it was my first time experiencing snow, a snowstorm. Oh, that was crazy. <laughs> <laughs> what, was, what was that like? That was my actual first, as I said, my first time seeing snow. So I was excited at first. And then I realized that there was a possibility that I'd have to train it. And then I was like, hmm, not that excited. Yeah. <laughs> and it gets cold when, it's, when, it, when the snow hardens. It gets really cold, doesn't it? Yes. It's, it's, it's wow. <laughs> <laughs> that was an experience. But overall, having Austria, like a different... Uh, different facilities, different resources, a uh, different place to just unwind and to train. It kind of, I think it rejuvenated me because because of COVID, we were in one spot, we are in one place for very long. As an athlete, I, for the last couple of years, I've spent a couple months in Europe flying all over the place. And so being stationary for so long, took a toll on me. So the fact that I was able to go to Austria to just, you know, be in a different place. It was therapeutic for me, for Megan, yeah. And during the process, you got a lot stronger, Meg. Um, you know, I remember seeing videos of you squatting, what, 200 plus <laughs> pounds. It's like, that's like twice your body weight and change, you know. You know, tell me about that growth physically for you as you developed as a hurdler on the coach Anfred because the, your strength levels jumped significantly during the last season. I think it just comes with the, the special attention, you know, the undivided attention that an athlete can get when uh, the coach is there all the time. And I think that's where, I, that's what I benefited, benefited from the most. The fact that he was there every gym session, he would say, Every time I lifted, he'd be like, increase. And I'm like, okay, increase the first time. Increase again. I'm like, oh, okay, do the squat again. And I was kind of, I'd be kind of rocky, you know, you know, not doing it perfectly. And then I'd come up and I'm like, okay, that's definitely it. Not increasing again. And then he'd be like, increase again. And I'm like, sir, what? <laughs> <laughs> because I'm used to just increasing when it feels comfortable. You know, mm -hmm. why move on when you're not comfortable? But sometimes improvement, sometimes strength is made in times when you're uncertain. Keep moving forward even when you're uncertain. So even though that was a physical uh, change where he was making me improve when I wasn't comfortable, it was also a mental change because it clicked in my head to say, yo, even when you're not comfortable, you need to keep moving forward, you need to keep building, you need to keep pushing because that's where real growth lies. Mm -hmm. so. Does that process continue this preseason? I mean, in terms oh. of those, those breakthroughs that you have physically and, listen, and mentally? Listen, I have, I posted a story the other day <laughs> with him 
being evil. Every single time I do anything, increase, increase. Listen, I'm doing the leg press and I literally cannot walk. I have to roll off of the machine. Increase. I'm like, dude, what? <laughs> but it does, it does uh, strengthen your mentally because one, you have to trust the coach. Mm-hmm. You have to trust that what he's doing is for the best, even though you're not really sure. Um, and then when you do it and it works out, you're like, oh, wow, you know, look at that. Look, if I gave up, I wouldn't have realized that I'm actually stronger than I think I was, you know? So. Yeah, so, so can you shed any light on how much stronger are you, now, you are now in terms of your leg press or your squats or your bench? Because I know those numbers have been climbing steadily. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I've just been in, I've just been in training for the past, what, three weeks? Mm-hmm. And I think it compared to last year, I am way, <laughs> way ahead of the curve. Whoa. So, yeah. So, so you're approaching like 250 and them things? Uh, uh, <laughs> maybe. Maybe. <laughs> Not far from it at all. Well, I mean, it's, it's, it's good to see that growth because, it, as you mentioned, because you actually preempted and my, my next question was about the breakthroughs physically helping you break through mentally in terms of your own personal development. But I want to go back to a few weeks before the Olympics. You had a couple of races in Europe. You were doing so good. I mean, a couple of 13s, you look kind of ragged every now and then. When did it start to come together for you? First of all, for the national championships, where you ran 1268, I think it was, to win uh, a stacked, against a stacked field. And of course, then in Tokyo, where you ran 1253 and 1255 and threatened the world record holder for that silver medal in the final. <laughs> Uh, it was really and truly letting the only thing I can uh, attribute my progress to is one, pushing through when I definitely couldn't see the end, when I couldn't see how the season was going to end, when everything was super blurry, just pushing through, uh, acknowledging that I couldn't do it on my own. I had to get divine intervention from our creator. And then thirdly, just trusting the process and listening to my coach. Um, I don't have, or I don't usually have an issue with my weight. And so losing weight is not something that I'd be used to. And my coach, when I got home in preparation for trials, he said, you need to lose some weight. And I'm like, me? Not that. Be nice. No need for lose no weight. <laughs> <laughs> what were you like? One, what, you were like, what, 110? No. I'm asking. <laughs> I was 124. Whoa. 122. Yeah. 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 And so, and I'm like, that was all muscle. What am I going to lose? <laughs> <laughs> but, I mean... As I said, you have to trust the coach. And so I went on it. I went on this crazy, crazy diet. And I ended up losing, I think, six pounds before child's. Mm-hmm. And I think that those things are what made the difference. And that paid off big time. I want to take you back to that final because that Sunday morning was crazy. Uh, you know, we, we can reflect on it. Omar McLeod, you know, didn't make the top three in the women's final, you know, there was almost mayhem. It mm-hmm. seems almost as if you benefited from being in the outside lane and not being in the middle where all of that madness was taking place. So take us through that final and what, because I remember you running off and then Matthew running onto the track and screaming and there's a lot of hugging and tears. <laughs> take me through that moment and what was that like for you when you recognized that you were a Jamaican champion for the second time following upon what was it 2016 I think was the last time when you won the national championships yeah um that moment for me was just thanking God for showing up uh because as he said earlier the couple of meets that I had before a couple of races that I had before were dismal to say the least 
Um, and so I, since then, I just was asking him to just show up for me um, because I can't do it by myself, I can't do it alone. And I felt like he showed up in a big way on that Sunday. Uh, in addition to me being extremely prepared, I know how to prepare for competition. That's one thing my father and Matthew always says to me, like I'm a completely different person when it comes to travel because I know what it takes to, 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 to win or to come top three mm -hmm. in a Jamaican 100 meter hurdles trials or race. And you don't take that lightly. And so I just kind of focused into that and was really, really, really excited that it worked out. It was just, I mean, no one believed that I would win. Probably that I made the team, but no one. My coach, he heard it from my agent, who is Caroline um, Freed. Mm -hmm. And he was like, wait, what? She won? What? <laughs> <laughs> so we were just all just really, really, really excited that it happened. Yep. Megan? Okay. Yes, sir. All right. So, so let's, let's get back to, I want to take you forward now to the Olympic final. Of course, you know, 12.53 going in. Um, 12.53 going in. And of course, you know, you had Brittany Anderson 12.40. You had, of course, the world record holder, Kendra Harrison. And of course, the Olympic champion, Jasmine Camacho Quinn, who has been unbeaten all year long. Did the... What happened in 2019 enter your mind any at all during that period? Absolutely. Absolutely. I had to do a session with my mental coach, Mr. Wesley Morris, or Dr. Wesley Morris, my bad. <laughs> right before, because I got lane nine, I was like, lane nine again? Oh! oh. But uh, we worked on it, and thank God it, I used it to my benefit mm. again. <laughs> so you, you, you managed to block it out completely before that gun? Yes. Great. Yes. So, Meg, how do you build on this now? You know, you're an Olympic bronze medalist, history making from a Caribbean perspective. World Championships are coming up in Oregon. The Commonwealth Games are coming up later on um, in 22 as well. Are you doing both? And um, what are your, I don't want you to tell me what your goals are right now, but you know, still <laughs> early season. But, um, how do, you, how do you improve on, on what happened in Tokyo? Well, I can tell you, the white, geez, was his last name again? The long jumper. He's a very good friend of my coach, Philip. And I sat beside him in the Olympic Stadium. Where Dwight Phillips? Was, Dwight Phillips, yes. Yes. Um, I sat beside him in the Olympic Stadium when Ivona was doing her high jump for the heptathlon. And I said to him, what's one thing that, you know, you know about track and field? And he said, improvement, we sometimes as athletes think that it takes one bag of things to improve, but it really doesn't. When you look at it, how much of a second do you need to improve? To, be a, to, 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 to improve your PB or to get the world record or whatever it is. It's extremely minuscule and that's the same thing or the same approach you should take to uh, your training. It takes just the little, little improvements to make it or to achieve your goal. And so that's what you focus on. And that's what I've been, we've been focusing on, just taking it one step at a time, one day at a time, improving Megan, not just the athlete, but the person holistically. Because mm -hmm. I mean, at the end of the day, I'm human. And if you improve all aspects, then something must register and, you know, something must happen. So. Yeah. yeah, paying attention to the detail because, you know, obviously, you're stronger now, you're more experienced, you're still as flexible as ever, and most <laughs> importantly, you're more confident than you ever have been before. Those are minor improvements as well. So maybe you've already achieved those levels that will make you a lot better hurdler in 2022 going forward. Fingers crossed. <laughs> I mean, I don't take anything for granted because absolutely anything can happen. I've mean, seen that with COVID and everything that's happening in the world. You just want to take it one step at a time, one day at a time. Improve one day at a time, one, one session at a time, one breath at a time. There you go. 
I mean, what better way to end it? Megan Tapper, thank you so much for joining us on On Point. And of course, looking forward to another outstanding season from you. It won't be such a, a surprise as to many people as last year, but certainly it will be a season to look forward to. Thank you, thank you, thank you so much for having me in. As always, it is a pleasure. <laughs> Always a pleasure. And of course, that brings us to the end of On Point for this week. I'm Leighton Levy. Of course, remember, next week we have another exciting guest for you. And we will talk more on On Point. On behalf of the crew, this is Leighton Levy saying goodbye for now. <laughs>